is uh, Dr. Allison Ravenscraft. She's our next speaker. And uh, I think some of you in the Native Plant Society of Texas uh, world are already familiar with her because she has made a couple of presentations to the, uh, some of the North Texas chapters up there. But uh, she is going to, has graciously agreed to update her presentation for this. So you folks out there in North Texas, it'll be some new material for you. Uh, she is the assistant professor at UT Arlington in the Department of Biology. Uh, her educational pedigree is a, a degree from Harvard University, a doctorate from Stanford University in California, and postdoctorate research at the University of Arizona. Her presentation, Feeding Your Friendly Backyard Herbivore, will explore the symbiotic relationship between native plants, insects, and microbes. So please welcome Dr. Allison Ravenscraft this afternoon. Allison. Hey, thank you so much for the introduction. Let me see if I can get my screen shared here. Get here. Oh, that's not the view I wanted. You'll see my slides very small. Okay, how's that? Looks good. Wow. Awesome. Great. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the, the kind introduction and the invitation to speak. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk to the Native Plant Society at the state level. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, and I, I run a research lab that studies symbiotic relationships between insects and microbes. So one of the main reasons that I first got really excited about native plants is that they're crucial for supporting native insects. And today I'm going to talk about how native plants support native insects and also the symbiotic microbes that live on those insects, uh, especially focusing on how different guilds of insects use plant tissues as a source of food. It turns out that plant tissue can actually be really difficult to eat and many herbivorous insects depend on symbiotic microbes to help them out. So since my expertise is on insect microbes and BOCs, most of the talk is gonna focus on how insects use microbes to help them eat plants. Just to give you a quick rundown of where we're headed this afternoon, I'll start by talking about why we should care about insects and especially native insects. Then I'll talk about the different ways that insects eat plants. Um, as I mentioned, with a strong bias towards how microbes help insects to do that. And then third is maybe a bit of a tangent. My research often ends up considering insects themselves as habitat for microbes. So I'll talk about a few examples from my research of the microbes that live inside the insect gut. So that, those examples will be stink bugs, which are the little critters on sort of the left-hand side of the screen here, and also uh, adult butterflies, although I've got a caterpillar pictured for you here. Uh, and then finally, I'll end up with some tips for how you can help and enjoy the insects in your own yard. So first, why do we care about insects? With this audience, I'm probably preaching to the choir when I say that insects play vital roles in ecosystems. So of course, uh, they, they pollinate our plants, which produces not only beautiful flowers, but also many of the fruits and vegetables that we eat. Uh, second, um, some roles that we don't think about as often, things like beetles and termites help us to decompose wastes and dead plant and animal tissues. Ants actually play a lot of important roles, including decomposition, the turning and aeration of soil, and even dispersal of some seeds. And predatory insects help to control the populations of other species that otherwise can become pests. Um, so I, I can't see the chat or the video when my presenter mode is running, but um, so I'll just have to trust that you can answer if you want to, but does, does anybody recognize these little monsters here? And the folks who have seen this part of the presentation, uh, you, that's cheating, you can't answer. Um, so <laughs> folks who haven't seen this part, um, does anybody recognize uh, this, this black and orange critter in the lower center, first of all? Um, and if you if you want to post to the chat, someone can just let me know if there are posts in the chat. Let's see. <laughs> I'm getting a no. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, I can see the chat. Yeah, so I've got exactly good job, guys. So you're getting um, ladybug larva. That is right. So um, these guys are really great great for uh, controlling aphids, both as larvae and as adults. 
Um, so these are, you know, people are commonly familiar that ladybugs are friendly and beneficial insect predators in your garden. Um, all right, what about, I think this second one on the left is harder. What about this sort of brownish gray critter on the lower left? Anybody, can anybody guess what that is? Ooh, antlion is a really good guess. Yeah, Kathy's got it. So this is actually, it looks really similar to an antlion, but this is actually a uh, lacewing larva. So that is what they look like as an adult. Um, so lacewings, um, you've probably seen these around. You may not have paid a lot of attention to them, but it turns out that they're also really effective predators on aphids and also I think really beautiful um, small insects for your garden. Um, they're of course beneficial as well, just like the ladybug. Um, so you may have, their larvae are, if you look on plant stems and under plant leaves, you will sometimes find their larvae. I think the adults are the most obvious. Um, they, they often come to lights at night. Um, but you also may have seen without realizing it, their eggs in your garden as well. So, so these are lacewing eggs. Um, they're just little, you know, sort of just, uh, ovoid uh, white um, eggs that are on these long stalks. Uh, we're not entirely sure why they lay the eggs like this, but we think that the long stocks uh, may be helping to protect them from, from predators that would otherwise eat the eggs. So it's great to find any life stage of, of these critters in the eggs in your garden. Um, so another important role that insects can play is that they're, they're food for a lot of larger animals. So they serve as the link that transfers energy from plants to the higher trophic levels, um, including things like lizards, birds, and bats. And finally, while maybe most people don't think of this, I spend a lot of my time thinking about this, um, insects are also important partners of many microbes. So microbes use insects' bodies both as habitat to live in, and some microbes use insects as, as vehicles to transport them to new places. So given how important insects are for many different aspects of our ecosystems, it's really disturbing that insect populations are declining worldwide. Studies in a bunch of different locations have repeatedly found that insect populations are falling. One recent example made big headlines in 2017, and this was a study in Germany that looked at abundances of flying insects that were collected in standardized traps over 27 years from 1989 to 2016, and they found a 76% decline in insect biomass in Germany. Um, and in another particularly disturbing study in Puerto Rico, so halfway around the world, uh, they, a group found that between the 36 years from 1976 to 2012, we lost 98% of arthropod biomass on the ground and 78% of massive arthropods in the canopy. So the first author of this study, when he was interviewed, said that he couldn't believe the results. Um, so he said, I remember in the 1970s that butterflies would be everywhere after the rain, but on our first day back in 2012, I saw hardly any at all. Um, so in addition to the, the mounting research data, many people anecdotally report that they've noticed insect declines over just the course of their own lives. So for example, there's this, this phenomenon called the windshield phenomenon, which is that um, people have noticed that in the summer, their windshields used to get covered with insect splats when they would be out on long road trips. But now we can drive long distances without having to clean the windshield. So why is this happening? Uh, we think that there are a lot of different contributors to insect declines. And one review study that I have pictured here uh, called it uh, death by a thousand cuts. So, so those cuts include climate change, uh, many different pieces of it. So warming temperatures, increasingly severe storms, droughts, fires, and also disruption of interactions between insects and the species that they depend on, um, so particularly plants. So even if an insect could survive the different temperature regime or precipitation regime of a changed climate, if its host plant can't, then the insect is, is stuck. Uh, another major driver of loss is habitat degradation um, and just complete habitat loss. Um, this includes urbanization, agricultural intensification, deforestation, and pollution of natural habitats as well. We also think that pesticide use has had unintentional but really major negative impacts on non-target insect species. And finally, non-native species of plants, animals, and pathogens have also devastating effects on native insects. So the good news is that planting native plants helps to mitigate many of these forces. Um, so, so why? How do native plants support native insects? 
Um, so first, I'm sure this audience knows that diverse and well-adapted plants provide much better habitat than lawns. So this you know, standard suburban yard provides very little shelter for any animal, including insects. And in comparison, diverse native plant communities and, and things like brush piles provide lots of shelter and structural complexity. So these habitats include stems, leaves, roots, bark, leaf piles, and rotting wood, just as, as some different shelter, uh, structural complexity. And this supports many different ecological niches, which in turn promotes high insect diversity. Second, plant diversity supports insect diversity not only because it provides habitat, but because, of course, many insects are adapted to eat particular kinds of plant. So in this lawn, very few sp plant species are present, and therefore, there are only a few species of insects that can find food there. So, you know, there's a couple examples of things that eat grass, turf grass, and we often consider them to be pest species. Um, but in contrast, a garden full of different plant species is going to provide food for many different insects. Um, so it's going to provide nectar, leaves, and saps with different chemical compositions. And the more of these varied foods we provide, the more insects we ultimately support. So the reason that plant diversity supports insect diversity is largely that many insects are specialized to eat particular species or parts of plants. And I'm gonna talk about four main categories of insect feeding, which are also called insect feeding guilds. So first there are the pollinators, uh, the bees, flies, and butterflies, and other insects that drink nectar. Second, we have the sucking insects that feed on uh, plant sepsis or, or even seeds. Um, they just suck the juices out of these things. And that includes things like aphids, leafhoppers, and uh, true bugs. Third, some insects are specialized to digest wood. Uh, these are things like termites and some beetles. Uh, and finally, fourth, some insects have evolved to chew on the softer herbaceous leaves and stems. Um, and these are things like caterpillars, many leaf feeding beetles, and grasshoppers. So an important thing to know about plant insect coevolution is that eating plants is hard for two main reasons. First, plant tissue is nutritionally unbalanced for, for generally any animal. Um, the reason is that plant tissue contains a lot of carbohydrates, but comparatively little protein, vitamins, and minerals. So one of the biggest problems is actually nitrogen. Um, animals use nitrogen in the form of protein, as a major structural component of our tissues. But plant tissues are primarily based on carbohydrates, uh, mainly cellulose, which is uh, primarily made of carbon. So their tissue contains comparatively less nitrogen than animal tissue. And as a result, herbivorous insects and other animals need to find a way to deal with this. Second, plants don't want to be eaten. So they fight back with physical defenses like thorns and stinging hairs, and also chemical defenses like toxins that um, can poison insects or other herbivores. So today, I'll discuss the different guilds of insects feeding behaviors and adaptations for dealing with these difficulties. Um, one surprisingly common solution is symbiosis with microbes, and because that's my specialty, I'll largely focus on that. So moving into the major feeding guilds of insects, I have to begin with pollinators because this is what most gardeners think of when we talk about supporting insect diversity. Uh, nectar is basically sugar water, so it's, it's really rich in simple carbohydrates, but it's comparatively poor in pretty much any other nutrient. Um, so bees uh, supplement this first with pollen. So pollen has comparatively a lot more protein content, um, so they can sort of balance their diet that way. Butterflies and flies will actually store nutrients from their larval feeding um, to supplement the sugars that they get from nectar as adults. Um, I should point out here that a, a lot of people assume that pollinators are, are specialized to feed on specific species of flower, but it turns out that most pollinators are actually pretty opportunistic. So they do have preferences, but if they can recognize it as a food source, if they can successfully land on it, and if they can get their, their proboscis, their, their tongue, into the flower, then they're usually pretty happy to feed on it. Um, and this is good news because it means that for us to support native pollinators, we can focus on providing a steady source of nectar throughout the year, rather than having to plant specific species of native flowers. Although native plants do, of course, still support pollinators much better than non-natives because our pollinators are adapted to recognize them. Interestingly, 
Um, in, in addition to pollen feeding, research has found that the bees um, have a stable community of bacteria living in their guts. Um, this is called the gut microbiome. And um, we know specifically for honeybees and bumblebees because they've been the, the best studied, they host a core set of about five bacterial genuses or genera in their guts. And these bacteria, we think, help the bees to digest their food. We know that the bacteria are capable of breaking down the sugars that are found in pollen and honey and nectar. And they also, um, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that the gut microbiota are actually protecting the bees from infection as well. So I've I've listed the five core genera of the bee microbiome here because um, even though these are big Latin words, you might actually recognize some of them if you, if you squint at them. Uh, so it turns out that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are also beneficial members of the human gut. Um, and so if you look at your yogurt or if you take a probiotic, if you look at the ingredients in your probiotic, um, you will very likely see these genera present on those, on those labels. Um, so I just think it's really cool that there is a suite of bacteria that is beneficial generally whenever it lives in the gut. And it can do that from anywhere from the insect gut all the way up to the human gut. But anyway, moving, moving past bees, if we look at the other pollinators like butterflies and flies, we actually tend not to see a core community of microbes there. Um, so these species seem to be relying on other strategies to cope with um, feeding on a sugar rich diet. Um, for example, like acquiring more protein during lar larval feeding. Um, so I'm not going to talk about beneficial symbionts of these insects, but later I will talk about butterflies as an example of basically microbial shuttle buses that might be potentially helping to move microbes around. Um, and, and when I'm talking about pollinators, I always have to talk about one of my personal favorite pollinators. Um, you may not know, I didn't know when I started out, that uh, mosquitoes are actually also pollinators. Um, so this is actually one of the most commonly overlooked ecological functions of mosquitoes. Um, so female mosquitoes do take blood meals. They bite us. We hate it. I hate it. Um, but they don't always take blood meals. They only take a blood meal when they're ready to develop their eggs. Um, so female mosquitoes actually usually feed on flower nectar and male mosquitoes exclusively feed on flower nectar. They never take a blood meal at all. Uh, furthermore, there are over 3,000 mosquito species on Earth, and only about 200 of those feed on humans at all. And of those, only about six mosquito species are major carriers of human disease. So, so there's, a, there's a few bad actors that are carrying diseases that we hate, and then most of the rest of mosquito species on Earth are just completely benign, um, even potentially pollinating our flowers for us. Uh, furthermore, it turns out that some species of mosquito exclusively feed on nectar. Even the females never take a blood meal. Um, so this, this is an elephant mosquito. Um, and I only, I only discovered these when I moved to Texas a couple of years ago. Um, they, they're huge. They're very noticeable. Um, they looked terrifying if you re recognize that that is a mosquito. Um, and I found them, they were super attracted to my uh, white bone set, my agaritina, uh, when it was flowering last fall. Um, but so you don't have to worry because these guys are, again, exclusively nectar feeders and beneficial pollinators. Um, even better, their larvae are beneficial as well. Um, so the larvae are predators on other species, other mosquito species larva. Um, and they're also just gorgeous. So they're um, this brilliant black and metallic blue, definitely something to watch for in your garden. Um, they like things like bone set and goldenrod. And I actually just saw one last week on my frost food. So they are back again for the fall. Um, one more cool fact about mosquitoes, it turns out that um, the larvae of a mosquito actually cannot develop in microbe-free, clean, sterile water. Um, so mosquito larvae actually obligately require a microbe to be present in its gut, and it can be almost any microbe, um, in order to be able to complete their development. So if you try to rear a mosquito in sterile water, it will, it will die before it ever reaches adulthood. So moving away from pollinators. On the other end of the dietary spectrum from nectar is wood. So nectar is super simple. It's basically just sugar water. And wood, on the other hand, is made of a lot of complex chemicals that are really difficult to break down. So any discussion of insect adaptations to eat plant tissue has to include termites. Termites have this really unusual ability to digest lignin and cellulose, which are the really tough fibrous components of wood. Um, and they depend on symbiotic gut microbiota that include both bacteria and protists to help them do this. 
And it turns out termites actually do have their own enzymes that can break down chemicals like lignin and cellulose, um, which is kind of strange by itself. Most animals do not do that. Um, but researchers have found that if you take away the gut flora from a termite, it will still starve to death, no matter how much wood it eats. So it can't digest wood by itself. So fascinatingly, not only um, do they depend on these microbes, um, these termites are actually hosting really unique species of microbes in their guts. Um, and they're hosting these beautiful protists. Um, so it turns out that each of those protists specializes on breaking down a different chemical component of the wood. And even crazier, the protists are actually relying on bacterial symbionts inside or on the surfaces of their own cells to do that. Um, so, so these are you know, two examples of the protist cells. And when you um, stain them with fluorescent dyes to detect particular bacteria, you can light up those bacteria either inside the cell on the lower uh, end of the slide or on the surface of the cell on the upper part of the slide. Um, so this is often described as a, a Russian doll or a nesting doll symbiosis. Um, so, you know, of course, you don't want termites eating your house, but most species of termite, kind of like most species of mosquito, aren't actually pests. So they'd much rather be eating the damp, moist, happy decomposing wood out in the forest rather than the trough, dry stuff that your house is made of. And so you can actually, you can leave dead wood on the ground to help support native termites. Just do it far from your house. You want to encourage them to stay outside. Um, and that's where they belong. But termites really are crucial members of our ecosystem because they can decompose plant tissues that really few other animals can. So we need them. And when you feed termites, you also feed their symbiotic protists and bacteria, which are incapable of living anywhere else on Earth. Um, so next, I wanted to talk about the sap-sucking insects. Uh, it turns out that there are two categories of plant sap, uh, not one, two. So there's phloem sap, which is a sugary liquid that transports things like sugars throughout the plant. And then there's xylem sap, um, sort of usually more interior part of the stem transport xylem sap, sap. And that is just mostly water transport for the plant. So first I'm gonna talk about phloem suckers. Aphids are a really classic example of a phloem sucker. So aphids are sucking on this sugary liquid. They get a ton of sugars but phloem doesn't provide them with enough nitrogen. Um, so aphids are, are deficient in amino acids because there aren't a lot of amino acids in, in phloem sap. So to solve that problem, aphids have a mutualistic relationship with buchanera bacteria. Uh, the buchanera live inside these specialized cells within the aphid abdomen. Um, so here you should be able to see uh, what look like big green blobs with smaller blue blobs inside them. So the big green blobs are actually specialized aphid cells to host bacteria. The blue blobs are the cell nuclei. And the, the green haze, if you look very hard, is actually composed of small, tiny green granules that are the individual, very, very small buchanera cells living inside the aphid, um, aphid bacterium. So the way this works is that the aphid provides carbohydrates and also a nice, happy, stable habitat for the buchanera bacteria to live in. And in return, the bacteria synthesize amino acids for the aphid, which allows it to live off of that really amino acid poor diet of plant sap. Um, turns out that, you know, this is really important for the aphid. So the bacteria, buchanera bacteria, is um, very faithfully transmitted from mother to offspring. And fascinatingly, the buchanera bacteria has lived inside aphids for so many generations that many of the genes it used to have for, so for survival out in the world became totally unnecessary because the bacteria just was never living by itself anymore. It's always inside the aphid. So as a result, those genes over time just kind of mutated and degraded and eventually got lost from the buchanera genome. Um, as a result, the genome is really, really tiny, but it does retain the genes for the synthesis of the amino acids that the aphid needs. Um, and as a result, the buchanera can no longer live without the aphid, and the aphid also can't live without the buchanera bacteria. Um, so as a second example, um, as the other type of sucking insect, um, this is a xylem sucker. So you may have seen this, this is called a sharpshooter. You've probably seen it in your garden. Um, this particular insect is the glassy winged sharpshooter. Uh, it's a type of leafhopper. And these guys drink xylem sap, which is even poorer in nutrients than phloem sap. So the, the sharpshooter needs not only amino acids, it also needs vitamins as well. Uh, it solves this problem again with bacterial symbionts. 
So when we open up its abdomen, we can see actually really brightly colored organism, uh, sorry, organs, um, kind of similar to the aphid. Um, those are the sort of orange and yellow tissues off to either side of the insect's abdomen there. Um, so it hosts not one, but two species of bacteria in those specialized organs. Both of them are very faithfully transmitted from the parent to the offspring. And both of those bacterial symbionts have undergone similar levels of sort of genome degradation, just like Buchnera. So it turns out that that is a common feature of symbionts that are transmitted from parent to offspring. Um, and even things like our, our mitochondria, which were also originally bacterial symbionts, have undergone gone this process of loss of most of the genome, but retention of the genes that encode the nutrients that the host needs to survive. So one of these bacteria in the sharpshooter is called Sulcia, and it lives in that orange part of the, of the, the bacterium, that special organ. Um, and it synthesizes eight of the 10 essential amino acids for its sharpshooter host. Um, what's really cool is that the second bacterium, which is called Baumannia, and it lives in that yellow part of the, of the organ, it synthesizes not only a bunch of vitamins that the insect needs, but it also synthesizes the remaining two amino acids that Sulcia isn't making for the insect. Um, so this is just a particularly beautiful example of coevolution between not two, but three different species um, and you know, all of them have worked together and specialized to the point where they, they only operate basically as a single unit and they can't survive without each other anymore. Um, so, and then next I wanna talk about one of my, my personal favorites um, as an example of a, a seed sucker. Uh, this is the, the species Leptoglossus fallopus. Uh, it's commonly called the, the leaf-footed bug because it's got these sort of little flag-shaped, uh, leaf-shaped uh, things on the ends of its legs. And they're pretty common in Texas. Uh, many of you have probably seen them. A few of you have been really awesome and mailed me some of these live. So thank you so much for that. Um, so <clears throat> I am always looking for them. Um, they, it was a bad year for them this year, um, but they're usually around. You've probably seen them. And leaf-footed bugs do drink xylem sap from plants, but they do that mostly as a source of water. So they get most of their nutrients by sucking on seeds. Um, in addition to that, they also get a nutritional boost from Burkholderia bacteria, and they host those bacteria in a special compartment of the gut called the M4 region. So this, this picture that I just pulled up is a picture of a dissected gut of the insect. Um, its head would be off to the left of the screen, and its tail would be off to the right of the screen. Um, and all those labeled sections with M's in front of them are different compartments of the mid gut. And then that final section labeled H is the hind gut. So you can actually see the Burkholderia bacteria in this photo because they are fluorescently labeled in yellow. So they're um, very specifically housed in the M4 region of the midgut. Um, so this, this symbiosis is crazy because the, it's really, really specific. And the junction between the M4 region where the bacteria live and the M4B and the upper regions of the gut is um, very uh, picky. And it only allows Burkholderia cells to pass through it. So no solids can pass through this gut at all. And so recent research suggests that the insect is obtaining many nutrients from the burkled area that are, that are living in this gut section and the gut section is totally dedicated to. Um, and so that includes things like amino acids and vitamins because the actual bacterial cells are pumped from the M4 region where they are happily living back up into the M4B region where the cells just get completely digested by the insect. Um, so I kind of like to compare this to humans eating nutritional yeast as a, just a general nutritional supplement. Um, so crazy symbiosis, it's kind of insane that this insect has effectively a closed gut so that it can house these bacteria. Um, I think the reason that it works is that the insect is again, a fluid feeder. So it doesn't really need solids to flow through its gut, but still this is really extreme. Um, and even weirder, Despite the fact that the insect is just highly adapted to host these bacteria, it actually doesn't transmit the bacteria from parent to offspring. Um, so when the eggs are laid and when the newly hatched nymphs hatch out of those eggs, they, they don't have the bacterium and they have to go out into the world and find Burkholderia in the environment every single generation. Um, so this is already really different from aphids and sharpshooters, uh, the previous examples that we saw. Um, when, Interesting result is that because they get their bacteria from the environment, these bugs uh, are you know, associating with many different strains of Burkholderia bacteria. Although individual insects usually end up only with one strain in their, in their particular M4. So this is a strange symbiosis and you might think it's just this one kooky insect, 
But it turns out that it's really widespread across many of these, these true bugs, things you might commonly call stink bugs. Um, many of these guys are seed feeders. So everything on this little um, phylogenetic tree here that's colored um, in, a, in any color hosts uh, these Burkholderia bacteria. Um, some of these other things, um, I think we've found evidence that like the, some of the like Guillardet do host these as well. Um, but we know for a minimum that at least six taxonomic families of insects, including hundreds of different insect species host these guys. Um, so these include things that you might see in your garden, like stilt bugs in the genus Gelysis. Um, these guys really like to feed on uh, bee blossom or gaura. Um, they're also on things like wild tobacco. They can damage your tomatoes in your garden as well. So they're they are both beneficial because they will they will kill other insects that are pests, but they can do some damage on your veggies as well. Um, there's also um, Burkholderia in things like chinch bugs, um, which are bugs that will naturally feed on wild prairie grasses. Um, they can also sometimes feed on turf grasses, so sometimes they're considered pests in lawns. Um, Burkholderia will associate with things like seed bugs, which you may see on things like your, your bee balm, your monarda. And um, down at the bottom here, Burkholderia is also present in um, broad-headed bugs, um, which are pretty common in Texas in the spring most years. So they, they like things like the seed pods of legumes and, and milkweed. Um, and they're really fun because the ants, uh, sorry, the, the nymphs of these broad-headed bugs look like ants. And then the adults often are, are wasp mimics. Um, so anyway, these are sort of my first example of how microbes use insects, and especially native insects, of course, um, to, to sort of ferry them around to, or use them as habitat. Um, so I asked the question, how many different strains of this symbiotic Burkholderia bacteria do these stink bugs actually host? Um, so I looked at that in these Gelysis bugs. Um, you can see them on a, a flowering head of, of native Gara here. Um, generally, if you go out and find Gara, you will often find these guys on the flower stalks. So I went and I sampled a bunch of different populations of Gelysis across the United States. And I found about 17 different um, common strains of Burkholderia bacteria that were present inside the insects. Although we actually detected over 60 strains of these bacteria in, in the insects, all the insects that we sampled. Um, so on this chart, each of the individual pies represents abundances, average abundances of different Burkholderia strains in a population of somewhere between 12 to 24 individual insects. And so the first thing that you may notice is that there's one really common strain of Burkholderia bacteria um, that's dominant in most of the population. So that's that white strain, sequence variant one. But once you look past that, then there are actually a bunch of strains that are more localized. So on the, on the East Coast, there is a magenta strain called sequence variant 13 and a sort of dark green strain that's sequence variant 35. And those are, those are pretty abundant on the East Coast and we don't really see them on the West Coast. Um, and then if you go to the West Coast, similarly, you see a sort of a dark blue sequence variant five and a bit of a teal sequence variant nine that are really localized to that area as well. So this is a ultimately a, an outcome of the fact that the insect is picking up the bacteria from, from the environment rather than just transmitting a single strain from parent to offspring. So, what does that mean for the insect? Um, so we actually took the insects into the lab and we infected them with four different strains of these Burkholderia. Um, and those, so those four strains are on the, on the x-axis of this plot. And we measured how long it took the insects to develop all the way to adulthood. And we found that the strains of Burkholderia did have different effects on the host. So insects that were infected with the, this yellow strain of Burkholderia, LEP1P3, um, developed slower. And the insects that were infected with the better strain, so that's, or the, sorry, the green or the teal strain, so LEP1A1 and TF1N1, developed much faster. And then this blue strain was kind of intermediate between the two. So generally, we assume that faster development is better for the insects. The faster you can reach adulthood and start reproducing, the more likely it is that you will be successful and you won't get eaten. Um, so in, if that is true, which we assume that it is, then this yellow strain, LEP1P3, is the least beneficial for the insect. Um, and I should mention that if you rear the insect without any Burkholderia, it does far, far worse. It generally can barely even reach adulthood at all, and it takes a very, very long time, something like 50 days to reach adulthood. So any kind of Burkholderia is better than nothing, but there is variation in how good different strains of Burkholderia are for the host insect. Um, so we also looked at the, the size of the insects at adulthood. Um, so you might think, oh, hey, maybe the insects that are infected with the yellow strain grow slower, but maybe they get bigger. Uh, it turns out that that is not true. Um, so 
on this second plot, we've got the, the weight of the insect on the y-axis. And this time it's actually better to be higher on the y-axis because it means that you're heavier. And we see that not only do the insects that are infected with this yellow strain grow slower, they also are significantly smaller. So they were about half the size of the adults from the other that were infected with the other three strains. So where are these, these Burgledaria distributed in, in wild populations of the insect? Um, so this is the same map that I showed you before, but I'm gonna recolor the pies according to the benefits that the bacteria provided to the insects in the lab. So first, um, there are a lot of Burkholderia strains that we just don't have any data for, so those are colored in gray. But then when we look at sort of the best strains, which I've just colored both of them in green, they, as you might expect, are really abundant in most populations of the books. But we do see some of the you know, okay and some of the least good um, strains, those blue and yellow ones, in some populations of the bug. And if you look at the top right corner, there are a couple populations, especially that most northern population um, on, the, on the East Coast, that are they have a lot of those two like less good strains and that far um, no, more northern east coast population actually has more of that yellow strain than either of the other two purple darius strains that we measured um so so what is going on here first it's possible that this could be a negative consequence of getting your bacteria from the environment so the insect you know isn't transmitting from parent to offspring and it therefore has almost no control over which strain its nymphs its, its babies are going to acquire. And so sometimes those babies may go out into the world and they might pick up a less good strain of Burkholderia bacteria before they ever encounter the, the really good strain. So that would be not great for the insect, but it's also possible that the benefits that these bacteria are conferring to the insect might depend on the environment that the insect is living in. So initially, I, I thought that some strains of the bacteria might actually help the insect to eat different host plants. Um, and I, so I kind of looked into that and it seems like that's not what's happening, but the bacteria still might help the insect cope with other types of environmental stress. And, and I know I've gotten away from plants here, but I just have to tell you this one cool example. Um, so this study looked at insecticide resistance in these bugs, and it found that in agricultural fields that were sprayed with the insecticide for nitrophion, there were free living Burkholderia bacteria doing their normal thing, living in the soil, and they evolved in response to the pesticide, they evolved to degrade that chemical. And then stink bugs came into the fields um, and just as they naturally would, they acquired their Burkholderia symbiont from this, the soil that had been sprayed with the pesticide. And that bacteria conferred instant resistance to the insecticide um, directly to the insect. Uh, so the insect didn't even have to do any evolution itself. Like within a single generation of the insect, it suddenly became resistant. Um, so this suggests a possible benefit of picking up your symbiont from the environment instead of getting it from your parents, because these insects are, you know, these insects haven't been exposed to the insecticide before, so there's no way that a vertically transmitted symbiont could have evolved to protect them. But in this case, the insect is actually taking advantage of bacterial adaptation in the environment to local conditions uh, prior to the insect becoming associated with that bacterium. So I just think that's really awesome, but um, I will return to plants and I've taken you on this kind of meandering stroll through several examples of insects that eat different parts of plants and then how bacteria can help them in many cases to eat those plants. Um, the examples of termites, aphids, uh, the sharpshooter or leafhoppers, and true bugs all demonstrate how bacteria can help insects compensate for a nutritionally unbalanced herbivorous diet and potentially also help the insect deal with other stressors like pesticides. And next, I'd like to briefly discuss how insects deal um, not just with the nutritional imbalance, but also with plant chemical defense. So plants and chewing insects participate in an evolutionary arms race that has given rise to a lot of Earth's biological diversity. And in this, in this struggle, plants evolve novel toxins to, to stop herbivore, herbivores and especially herbivorous insects from eating them. And in return, herbivores evolve ways to detoxify those poisons. Um, and this is particularly relevant for chewing insects, which I'm showing here, um, because they, they just, they gobble the plant tissue, they mash it up, and so they're forced to consume all of the plant's chemicals. 
Um, other insects are able to avoid some of the plant's chemicals. So things like sap suckers are really just sucking the sap, either the phloem or the xylem. And in many cases, a lot of the toxins in the plant are concentrated in the actual leaf tissue um, or the other tissues of the plant. Um, so if you're chewing on a tissue, you're getting all of those nasty chemicals and there isn't really a way to avoid them. Um, well, there isn't a way to avoid all of them. Um, so these caterpillars, these are a monarch, a pipevine swallowtail, and a gulf fritillary, um, are common examples that many of you will have seen and even encouraged in your native plant gardens. Um, so uh, monarchs are eating milkweed, the pipevine swallowtail is eating pipevine, and the gulf fritillary is eating uh, passiflora, which I think um, one of the species at least is commonly called maypop. And so these guys are specialized to eat these toxic plants and they therefore have a lot of different coping mechanisms. Um, so one really cool thing that monarchs will do, and it, we think also some of these other caterpillars are doing, um, monarchs will avoid a lot of that sticky white latex that, that gives milkweed its name by chewing through the base of each leaf's stem before they start to eat the leaf. So what happens is you, if, you, if you see a milkweed plant and you notice a, sudden a leaf just sort of fall and sort of hang perpendicularly, um, that is almost certainly a monarch that has bitten the leaf off at the base of the stem. And that prevents the latex from, from flowing into the stem. So there's still a little bit in there, but the plant can no longer um, just pump latex into its leaf in response to predation, um, in response to herbivory by this caterpillar. So um, we definitely know that monarchs do that. Some of these other caterpillars appear to maybe do that too. Um, so not only do these caterpillars have their own um, sort of innate behavioral ways of avoiding these toxins, um, they also have uh, ways to even use the toxins for their own benefit. So again, monarchs are the best studied example. Um, they will take some of those toxic um, cardenolides that are present in the milkweed and they will sequester them in their own insect tissue. And it makes the insects really, really bitter and really um, unpleasant to eat. So um, there are some really fun videos you can look up online of blue jays being fed uh, monarch butterflies that are full of these toxins. And the blue jays will actually like immediately sort of spit the monarch out and just, just vomit because it was so foul. So a lot of these insects do have their own way to deal with plant poisons. However, um, we've actually almost entirely overlooked a potential third faction in this coevolutionary arms race, which are the microbial inhabitants of the insect gut. And so the, the theory that gut microbes might detoxify plant poisons has been proposed uh, a bunch of times in the literature um, and there's been several studies that have shown this happens in particular insect species. And one of the major goals of my lab's current research is to ask how common this is and how important it is for different insects. Um, most of the evidence suggests that caterpillars, which are very specialized usually, um, may not be benefiting a lot from their gut flora. Um, they've dealt with, they've evolved their own ways to deal with plant poisons. But what about other insects like, like grasshoppers and beetles? Um, so it turns out that recent evidence evidence suggests um, beetles in particular, um, some other microbes, some other insects as well, but beetles in particular use gut bacteria to help them eat plants. Um, and one recent study on this guy, the cucumber beetle, found that when they ate uh, brassica crops, so things like kale, the bacteria in the beetle's gut adapted to detoxify mustard oils, which are the main defenses of these crops. And that allowed the beetle to survive better and to grow better on, on things like kale. So my lab is, is, I'm really interested in this, and my lab is trying to study and quantify the phenomenon across a bunch of different insect species. Um, so then my, my final example of, of sort of insects as, as habitat for, for microbes, and particularly native microbes, um, is, is adult butterflies. Uh, butterflies eat one of two main diets, uh, either like species will either be specialized to feed on flower nectar or the uh, juice of, of wild fruits. So here in Texas, we'll generally just see the nectar feeding species, but in the tropics uh, where fruits are present year round, butterflies are adapted to uh, find rotting fruits on, the, fruits on the forest floor and feed on the juices that ooze from those fruits. Um, so I focused on these diets, both in terms of their microbial load and their chemical composition. Um, because microbially diet is the major way that a host is exposed to environmental microbes. And chemically, the diet can act as a, a filter on which microbes are able to persist both in the food before the insect swallows it, and then also inside the gut after the insect has swallowed them when they're being bathed by the diet. So uh, I went to Costa Rica and I caught about over 300 individual butterflies. Um, these are just the most common of the species that we sampled. Um, and 
there were in total, um, of, we got 24 frugivorous species and 28 nectivorous species. We dissected each butterfly, we removed its gut, and we used DNA sequencing to identify which bacteria were present in the butterfly's guts. And one of the most striking numbers that came out of this is that 85% of the DNA sequences that came out of these butterflies' guts belong to bacterial species that were also present in the host's food. So that suggests that the vast majority of the gut flora in these insects comes directly from the external environment and enters the gut with the food. And butterflies might be a little bit of an extreme example here because they, they don't really contact other members of their species. They're not social like termites. Um, mothers and offspring don't, all, don't contact each other. And they also undergo pupation or metamorphosis during which they actually just void the contents of their gut entirely. So there are a lot of uh, potential choke points that prevent maintenance of uh, dedicated stable gut microbiota in these animals. So they're extreme. But they're not exceptional because there's a lot of insects that are similar that are non-social and that undergo metamorphosis. So recent research has shown that a lot of these insects have gut flora that, is, that are very similar in composition to the environments that the insects live in. And largely in the literature, we've been just ignoring this 85% as cells that are passing through the gut and not doing much for the host. But I wanted to ask what this might mean for both the gut microbes and for the host insect. And I started with a really simple hypothesis that gut flora would be better able to digest chemical compounds that are present at high concentration in the, in the insect's diet. Um, and I had shown that fruit at the field site, and fruit probably generally, contains a higher ratio of amino acids to sugars than nectar does. So that leads just to the simple prediction that fruit feeding butterflies gut flora will be better at digesting amino acids, whereas nectar feeding butterfly, butterflies gut flora will be better, relatively speaking, at digesting sugars. So I dissected the butterflies, mashed up their guts, and I used a culture-based assay to measure which chemical compounds the microbes were able to digest. Um, this is a picture of one of those assays. And basically, if you get color development in one of the wells, that tells you that the gut flora can degrade a particular chemical. So each, each well of that plate has a particular carbon compound or nitrogen compound. Um, and just to vastly summarize the data in a small figure, um, this plot shows um, the main results. So if a point on that plot is above that dotted horizontal line, it means that frugivores degraded that particular chemical better than nectivores. Um, and again, if the, if the dot is on the lower half of the plot, it means that nectivores degraded a chemical better than frugivores. And the takeaway from that plot is that basically the hypothesis is supported. The gut flora of frugivores do degrade amino acids better than sugars and um, nectivores do the reverse. They're better at digesting sugars. So this pattern could result from adaptation of the microbes that are living in the food before they're swallowed by the butterfly or adaptation um, after they're swallowed by the butterfly while the bacteria are just sort of sitting in that diet, floating around, sloshing around in the gut. But either way, it means that there's functional matching between the abilities of the gut microbiota and the ecology of the butterfly host. And that happens either in spite of, or maybe even because of this large influx of environmental microbes into the gut with the food. Um, and of course, I have to say that we don't actually know whether this is beneficial or detrimental to the butterfly. It might help the butterfly if the bacteria are just digesting those nutrients and providing some kind of service, um, but maybe the bacteria are just sucking nutrients away from the host. We, we can't be sure. Uh, but um, just to sort of wrap up the, the research part of the talk so far, um, we have seen that insect populations are declining worldwide and habitat loss is one of the major causes. We know that native plants support native insects. And um, one of the reasons is that that insects, uh, especially plant-eating insects, are adapted to specialize on certain parts of plants or certain plant species. Uh, that is ultimately, the specialization results from the fact that plants are hard to eat. Um, they're both nutritionally difficult, um, they're nutritionally poor in certain, in certain uh, things that the insects need, and they're also chemically defended. Um, so microbes may help insects with both aspects, both problems of a plant-based diet by providing missing nutrients and also potentially by detoxifying plant chemical defenses. And finally, insects are both the houses and the buses for microbes. So when you plant native plants, you're supporting an ecosystem. So you're not just supporting the insects, but you're also supporting the microbes that depend on those insects. Um, and then finally, um, so I, I hope I've convinced you that the insects and their microbes are really fun and I hope you wanna help and enjoy them in your yard. Um, so, so how can you do that and what, what can we do? 
Um, so there is a really nice recent paper that just came out that uh, proposed eight simple steps that people, just individuals can take to help insects. Uh, and the first several are basically all related to creating insect friendly habitats. Um, so that's converting lawns into diverse habit, natural habitats with lots of native plants, yep, actually growing native plants, um, and reducing pesticide and herbicide use, of course. And so fortunately, um, it's really exciting that I'm talking to people who are really already on top of these first three aspects. So this is really important. Um, so when you see these fun insects in your yard, you can know that you're, you're making a difference. Um, other things that um, we talk about less commonly, but are also really important is to limit the use of, of outer lighting on your house. Um, so you know, remember to turn those outdoor lights off when you go to bed, because insects can get really confused by these. Um, it can disrupt you know, their circadian rhythm. Um, it can also even sort of distract them and prevent them from being able to find mates. Um, another thing that people often don't think about is um, so lessening soap runoff. So trying not to just sit there washing your car in your driveway and letting a lot of soap run into your yard um, and reducing the use of other chemicals like driveway sealants and um, de-icing salts in the winter. And then um, finally, the other sort of category of things you can do is increase awareness and appreciation. So you wanna counter negative perceptions of insects. I hope I've helped to do that with some of our um, potentially most hated species like mosquitoes and termites. Um, some of them are pests, but most of them are, are good for us. Can't even be pollinators. Um, you can become uh, an educator and advocate for insect conservation. And as um, we saw really beautifully in the, in the last talk, you can get involved in politics and, and vote and contact your local representatives, um, advocate for important things like the Recovering um, America's Wildlife Act, um, and, and try and get some political support behind this as well. Um, finally, I will leave you with, um, if you want to sort of learn more about the insects in your yard and identify them, um, I've actually found that there's a really great, um, I, I loved the Seek app. It's free. You can install it on your phone and then you can just point your phone camera at an insect or really any other animal or plant. Um, and it will do its best to identify it for you. Um, sometimes it does better than others, but I've been really pleasantly surprised at how well it can do with a lot of insects. Um, and Seek is the sort of partner app for a website called iNaturalist, which hopefully many of you know about. Um, that is sort of the more high powered research grade side of, of this um, particular organization. Um, so you can also go onto that website directly and get your photos identified. Um, and for both iNaturalist and this other website called Bug Guide, you can go up and post a picture of something you don't know what it is or you want an identification on it. And there are a lot of um, really great people who will post an ID for you within oftentimes within a few hours. Um, and I'll just end with like, if you, uh, with sort of a, a plug that if you've got these particular insects, I am looking for them. I'm always looking for leaf footed bugs for my study of bug burgled area relationships. Um, I've gotten uh, shipments of live ones from a few members already, and it's been awesome. Um, and then I'm also looking for uh, these various uh, leaf feeding insects. So the cucumber beetle, Colorado potato beetle, uh, flea beetles, and hornworm and cabbage loopers to survey their gut flora for their ability to detoxify plant defenses. Um, so if you if you have those bugs and you would like me to take them off your hands, um, you can contact me at my email address here, alison.ravenscraft.uta.edu. Um, if you're interested to see how our research is going, that's my lab's website up at the top there. Um, I need to update it. I will soon. And um, I occasionally um, tweet on the Twitter, although I haven't been very active recently. Um, but anyway, with that, um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for letting me talk. And I would be happy to take any questions. Quite a lesson in microbiology. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> what kind of equipment do you need to, you know, I'm just thinking what kind of equipment you have to analyze all of this, the chemical equipment, the micro, the microscopic a aspect of this is, is just mind boggling. It really, it really ranges. You can do it you can do it pretty cheaply with petri dishes, but if you want to go in depth and really identify them and, and do the chemical work, then you need then you need university resources and DNA sequencers wow. and that kind of thing. Wow. But you can do a lot. Undergrads can do a lot. Like they can, you know, run around with butterfly nets catching insects. They can identify them. They can do the dissections and put the bacteria on petri dishes. So there's a lot that you can do before you get into the complicated stuff. Wow. Hmm. Any other questions out there? Well, this is sort of a weird question probably, but I, I started thinking about the fact that, you know, they have, these insects have the same kind of similar gut bacteria as some of the uh, stuff in our own guts. And I was thinking like, well, 
how do I, would some of these insects be beneficial for us to be eating them? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I mean, in terms of the microbial side of things, 